So this guy comes up to me the other day. He says, you objectivists are a bunch of nerds. And I said, you talking to me? <laughs> now, I know you're not talking to me, right? So, so, so anyhow, on a, on a serious, I got my, if you guys, some of you guys are too young, but it's a classic, the old Al Pacino remake of Scarface, remember Tony Montana? I figured, what, what better look for an objectivist conference? Anyhow, <laughs> seriously, Craig mentioned uh, my book on, before I get to the trader principle, can everybody hear me, by the way? Craig mentioned my book on heroism. The, the title is Heroes, Cha Heroes, Legends, Champions, Why Heroism Matters. It is uh, complete. I sent it to the uh, publisher, Union Square Publishing, two weeks ago. They promised me an answer by, uh, by today. And here's an email. At 1.44 p.m. from Scott Frischman, Acquisitions Editor at Union Square Publishing. Hi, Andrew. It is my pleasure to formally accept you to the Union Square Publishing family. The, <laughs> thank you. The publishing committee thoroughly enjoyed reading your manuscript. So below you'll find the contract and, and everything. Now, one, one great thing about, they're, they're a, a major hybrid publisher. One great thing about them is that unlike, say, the conventional publishers, HarperCollins, Random House, somebody like that, once, once you get through with the editing process at the, at the New York publishers, it takes a year to two years to get the book out. At, at Union Square, they promised me once we get through the editing process, we'll have the book out in 12 to 13 weeks. So that means sometime by the end of this year, the, the book on, on what it means to be a hero, uh, definition of hero, tying the hero to observational. I'm, I'm excited. Uh, I have to lecture on trader principle. I you know, really want to lecture on heroes, but we'll do that next year. All right. Now, the trader principle, of course, uh, uh, an important, important principle out of, out of the objectivist ethics and the essence of it, briefly, is the, the moral rectitude of voluntarily exchanging value for value for value. Now, I've given this talk uh, many times recently uh, in, uh, in the UK, in Poland, in various places in Europe, many times at Clemson, at the, Clemson, uh, at the FEE CISC summer conference. And that reminds me, regarding the hero book, I wanted to thank a few people. I want to thank Brad Thompson at CISC for hiring me to write the, the hero book. I want to thank Craig Biddle for his work in editing it. I want to thank Carl Barney, who in various ways funded the writing of, of that book. So I want to make sure, you know, thank thank everybody publicly uh, for that. Yeah. So th this talk on the, on the trader principle is becoming, is becoming uh, popular. So let me, let me start with a few uh, different examples. So, for example, uh, Microsoft, let's say, and Honda contract, and they trade X, X units of operating system for Y amount of dollars. Well, there's one example. Let's change the venue. Let's change the arena. Different kind of example. A friend of mine who's a good person, very good person. In fact, he's more, he's more than a friend of mine. He's an objective at Soul Brother. So he wasn't working. We go out to dinner one night. I, I, pay, for, I pay for dinner. All right, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a second example. A third, a third one. The best relationship advice I've ever seen came from a book. Uh, I think the title of it was His Needs, Her Needs. And the, the, the guy's a psychotherapist. He's also a minister of some Protestant denomination or other. And he gave the best relationship advice I've ever heard. Of course, I was already divorced, so it did, did me a lot of good. But... Uh, <laughs> but um, he said, regarding, regarding relationships, what, what you do is, you know, the, the, two, the, the two partners, you ask each other, what can I do to make you happy? Each one asks his or her partner that, and then you sincerely commit to doing what, what will make the other person happy. And when I read that, I said, well, why did I think of that? I, I, I mean... It's so simple, 
and often, often the most brilliant insights are, are simple. That's uh, so. Here's a, a married couple, let's say, who do who do that, or you know, they're or they're a couple anyway, married or otherwise. They're in love. They do that, and they do for each other the things that will make the other person happy, and not just do it for each other, but they express their their gratitude to the other person for doing the things that will make me happy. There's a third example. I'll give you one more, and then we'll uh, extract various principles from these examples. Former student of mine, many years ago, read The Fountainhead in my ethics class, and you know, you know, responded to, to the book the same way I did, and went on to read Atlas Shrugged, and became a fire-breathing objectivist. And now you know, he's a, a very good friend of mine, objectivist, another objectivist, soul brother. One great thing about teaching philosophy is I create my own body of friends. But, uh, but uh, I'll ask him to do something for me now, you know, for the last 20 years, and he'll do it gratefully, and I'll, I want to reciprocate, pay him or something, and he, and he says to me, he said to me over and over again, he says, Andy, he said, with me, you are paid up for life. So, you know, that's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fourth, there's a fourth, uh, now these are, these are very different examples. Now, what do they share in common? Well, notice the exchange of values in differing forms. What, what are values? Very simply, they're the things, persons, activities that we consider of great worth, the things that are, are valuable to us, the things that impel us to goal-directed direct, goal action, to gain and or keep them, whether it's education, a productive career, a relationship with a man or woman we have real feelings for, uh, children. Whatever, whatever they are, but values are those things, to put it simply, values are those things we consider of great worth, those things we consider of, val of value and that we take action to, to gain and or keep. So notice, first example, money is exchanged for software. In the second example, you know, I buy dinner for, for, my, for my friend, for my brother, in return for the joy I receive from his company and from the virtues that, that he, he embodies. And notice, in a close relationship, friendship or romantic love, notice the, the, that they involve a ceaseless quid pro quo with nobody keeping score. I mean, that's I think is, is, is essential to a good relationship. There's a ceaseless quid pro quo with nobody keeping score. Uh, in, the, in the romantic relationship that, I, that I, I just described, notice the trade in two, in two forms. I do for you the things that will make you happy. You do for me the things that will make me happy. But also, in addition to that, is I feel and express to you a sincere gratitude, a thank you for your loving uh, commitment to, to my happiness and the sincere gratitude and the sincere thank yous go back and forth, as well as the deeds performed for each other. And in the last example, I don't even know what to say about that. It always, it always chokes me up when he tells me, Andy, with me, you are paid up for life. I said, well, I, I, you know, that's, in other words, one of the things I love about that is he realizes the enormous value of objectivism. He realizes the enormous value of reading Ayn Rand's books uh, reading the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged and finding the objectivist philosophy, he realizes the enormous value of it. And so I repay him all the things he does for me, uh, since I don't consider myself paid up for life, but I repay him for all the things he does for me with a sincere and heartfelt thank you. And let him know how much I appreciate all the things he does for me, even though he won't let me do anything else. All right, so observe here the currencies exchanged are of value to the recipient in each case. Right? The currencies exchanged are of value to the recipients in each case. The software to Honda, the money to Microsoft, the money uh, to, my, to Microsoft and the R&D or whatever the Microsoft hierarchy wants to, wants to do with that money are of value. The, the, the great uh, happiness and joy I get from my, from my friend's company and his virtues and what he gets from mine, these are values. The, 
the deeds done for each other in, in the loving deeds done for each other in, in the rela romantic relationship and the sincere gratitude expressed a value. Uh, introducing some person to objectivism is a value. His willingness to do all kinds of things for me in exchange of a value. My sincere gratitude to him for the things he does. These are values to the people who receive them. There's no, there's no uh, justice in an exchange if one person doesn't uh, acknowledge as a value that which he or she's getting in the exchange. I mean, if I try to uh, introduce some Marxist professor, you know, that, that I was a colleague of mine. Hey, I'll give you a copy of Atlas Shrugged. He's, he, you know, he, he, <laughs> his reaction would probably be, I'll burn it. You know, he's, he's not, he's not going to recognize that as a value. Better value for Marxist professor is I break his nose. But that's another story for, for, an, for another day. Uh, so everyone is happier after and because of the exchange than they were before it. Right? Everyone is happier after and because of the value exchange than they were before it. Each person receives uh, in, the cur in a currency that is a value to the, to the recipient. Now, you see, we see the reciprocity of the exchange of, of, of values. And I, I think it's important to point out here that you know, a, a good person, somebody who cares about justice, a just person wants to repay an act of kindness, wants to make it a trade rather than an act of charity. Now, justice in part is treating people in accordance with what they've earned, for better or worse. And for example, there's a story that, you know, that, that I've heard in, in many iterations in, 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 in different times. There's a country doctor. Uh, very often his, his patients are poor. You know, the harvest isn't in yet. They don't have it. They don't have anything. Or so in some, some countries, I, mean, I think this, the first time I heard this story, uh, it came from Sicily, where the, where the farmers or the peasants are poor generally. But the country doctor performs various medical services, delivering a baby, you know, cures the husband or the wife or the child of some ailment, does you know, the family some very, very powerful benefit. The farmers or the peasants don't have any, any money to, to pay the doctor, but they don't want this as an act of charity. They, want, they, they recognize that a just person wants to exchange a value for, for the benefit that they receive. And so they'll do whatever it takes. Doctor, I'll paint you a house, or you know, in my spare time, I'll, I'll fix your car. I'll, when the tomato crop comes in, I'll, you know, I'll give you, you know, 20 pounds of, of tomatoes. In some way, shape, or form, a good person recognizes that uh, you, you want to make this an exchange. You want to make this a trade. You want to be able to, to return value for value. And at the very least, at the very least, you want to be able to tell. There's nothing else you could do for the person who's done something for you. You tell them a sincere and heartfelt thank you. So, so that the, the, the benefactor knows he or she is living in a human world where human beings appreciate the good that, the good that you've done for them. And a, a, a couple of uh, stories here. I remember once... Many years ago in New York, when Leonard Peikoff was lecturing at the old uh, Statler Hilton on 7th Avenue across from the garden. And I remember once in, in one of his, his uh, lecture courses, somebody asked him in the Q&A, on, on the objectivist ethics, what's the moral status of charity? And I remember Dr. Peikoff saying, you know, under certain circumstances, charity is morally, uh, has, has certain moral rectitude. Uh, what, what are those circumstances? Well, first of all, the, you make sure the person you help is a good person, not some vicious person. Because if you're helping somebody who's dishonest or, or, or vicious, what you're really doing is then just, then just helping them harm or you know, wreak uh, persecution on, on innocent people. So you make sure the recipient is, is a good person and is down and out you know, through no fault uh, of, his, of his or her own. You make sure... You do this as a value to you. You do it because you want to, not because you have to. It's not a Kantian duty to you, but you, you want to help this person. It's not a sacrifice. 
And I remember Leonard concluded by saying, and, and the recipient says, thank you. And I think that's important. The recipient says, thank you. It's a value given to the benefactor, letting, letting uh, him or her know this is a human world where good deeds are appreciated by the people who benefit from them. And as a, this is a tiny little example of that. I, I live in the New York area. You didn't know that, right? People hear me talk, they think I'm from Alabama, but they're, you know, they're wrong, I'm not. Uh, so, you know, it's traffic in the morning, I'm going off uh, to teach, and, and some poor bastard, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to, you know, some poor guy is trying to make a left turn into, into you know, all this traffic. So I'll stop for a second, wave him on. The person will make the left, wave thank you to me. I'll wave back, you're welcome. You know, and for that one moment, it's almost as if we're two human beings living in a human world rather than a couple of rats in a, in a maze. And, and, you know, and the interaction is, is, a, is a trade. It's an, it's an exchange. You know, I did a, a small good deed for this person. The person was sincerely grateful. And we had this moment of human contact that, you know, that brightens out. It's a value to each of us, and it brightens our day a little bit. You know, for, for both parties, everybody, everybody wins, except for the guy behind me who's in a hurry to get to work and is leaning on his horn for, for, letting, for letting this other poor guy make a left. But yeah, I think it's, uh, it's often overlooked, even, even by good people, it's often overlooked how much of a value, sincere gratitude and a heartfelt thank you is, you know, for somebody, for somebody who does who, who does you a, a good deed, how much that means. If there's no other way to, to uh, make it an exchange, to repay the benefactor, a, a sincere thank you goes a long way. Now, the deeper, the deeper reasons that uh, trading is, is, is virtuous, there's, there's really only a couple of more points that I want to make, and then I think we could throw it open to Q&A. But the, the deeper reasons that trade is, Actually, there are several points I want to make. But the deeper reasons for why trade is, is, is a virtue, and that is familiar to anybody who's, you know, who's, who's read Atlas Shrugged, that, that the values human life depend on must be created and exchanged. Right? And this is, this is objectivist ethics 101. Right? The, the values that human life depend on must be, must be created and, and exchanged. So, you know, the, the classic example is somebody has an orchard, grows apples, and trades them for meat with the butcher. Uh, well, let me give another example. So, you know, Craig and Sarah Biddle put on, you know, this great conference, and I lecture here, and in, in, in return for the lecture, I get paid in, in cash, or well, actually a check, but it, I'm guessing it won't bounce. And... Um, <laughs> I take that to the bank, and I can and I could write checks on it. I could pay the rent, or I could oh, actually probably go in. My daughter, believe it or not, is 16. She's going to be going to college a year from September, so put it into the, her, her college fund. But the point is, you know, there's uh, the, the human life and well-being depend upon the uh, uh, creation and the voluntary exchange of values. This is why the trader principle is so important. Trading value for value supports human life. I think it was Jean-Baptiste Say, the great French economist, who said, produce, produce, that's the whole thing. I think we can you know, add to that. Produce, produce, trade, trade, that's the whole thing. That's how wealth uh, is generated across an entire society. And one day the human race might realize that, that it's, it's not by plunder that, that, we, that we create, uh, that by which we generate uh, society-wide prosperity. It's by production and voluntary exchange of values. Even the plunderer will do better if he beats his sword into plowshares and his tanks into tractors, uh, produces wealth, and then exchanges with other producers voluntarily. Trading value for value supports life. So the trader principle, for one concerned uh, to uphold human life, the trader principle must be embraced full-mindedly, wholeheartedly, and good-naturedly. Human life is the standard of value, 
and the trader principle provides it abundant support. Now, I want to point out here something that's often overlooked, and that is that, that the trader principle applies uh, in, in, in spirit as well as in matter. So it, it, it is right and proper that we trade intellectual, uh, spiritual, spiritual values as well as material ones. Now, Ayn Rand points out that love is in part a payment for somebody's virtues and the joy that this person brings in, into your life. So notice the various ways in which human beings create and voluntarily exchange intellectual and or uh, spiritual values. So uh, a great artist, and Brian Lawson is, uh, is lecturing at this conference, right? And I love, I love his paintings. They, they just, to me, they, they're just the, the sublime, um, and, and they raise a sense of exaltation in my emotional life. So a, a great artist, gives us a sublime spiritual value. And so we pay for that if we buy the painting in part or, or, or we pay to, to enter an exhibit of the, of the painter's work. We pay in part with money. But also we pay in part with gratitude and with sincere praise of the artist's work. Now I can give you a good example. In the 1970s, when Ayn Rand was still alive, she passed away in 1982, when Ayn Rand was still alive and I was old enough to have read her novels. And, and it's, it's just, it's an unrepeatable intellectual, emotional experience to read The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged for the first time. And, you know, I, it, it's, it's an enormous intellectual, uh, spiritual value. First of all, Ayn Rand, in my judgment, is the greatest novelist in world literature. She wrote these magnificent novels. It's just an extraordinary artistic, literary artistic experience to read her books and, and appreciate them. But secondarily, she's you know Ayn Rand was first foremost and always a novelist. I mean, why did she why did she dabble in philosophy? <laughs> because she wanted to project an ideal man in fiction, and she needed to develop a philosophy. You know, tr try that sometime. <laughs> become the greatest philosopher since Aristotle as a secondary means towards accomplishing your real goal, which was to project the ideal man in, in, in works of fiction. So it's an extraordinary you know, artistic experience we get from reading Ayn Rand's novels, but also uh, the, the thematic content and the way it's integrated into the novels, especially in Atlas Shrugged, of course, but Rourke's courtroom speech at the end of The Fountainhead also, but especially in Atlas Shrugged, the wisdom uh, contained in these novels that you can get today from Amazon for like $10. Anyhow, uh, so Ayn Rand was still alive and I did everything I possibly could. I told everybody I could, I, 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 who, who would listen to me and even people who wouldn't, you know, that they should read Ayn Rand's novels. I got used copies of some of the novels and, and gave, them, gave them to people trying to bring, and, to, and to, to some extent succeeding in bringing to Ayn Rand's books a wider audience than they might otherwise have gained, something that was of enormous value to Ayn Rand. She wanted her books to be read. She wanted you know, them, them to be understood. And so you see the exchange of, of, of values here, um, doing everything I can to bring readership to Ayn Rand that she deserves in, in, in exchange for the uh, intellectual, spiritual values that her books and philosophy c convey. There's, um, so there's any number of such examples, and the underlying reason, of course, is, is that man is a being of soul-body integration. We are, human beings are an integration of soul and body. And so we are a composite of both. So notice, notice the cross-pollination of trading, of trading values. So a great lecturer disseminates wisdom. I'm pat myself, like me, I'm pat myself on the back. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to break my shoulder, pat myself on the back, right? But let me use, uh, let me use Leonard Peikoff as, as an example seriously because he's the greatest, the greatest lecturer I've, I've ever heard, uh, by far. Uh, a great lecturer disseminates wisdom in any field in philosophy, in the sciences, regarding the arts or whatever, gets paid in cash, let's say. And with that cash, uh, 
cash is a cash is an amazing value, right? There's so many things that we could that we could do with it. Let's say in this case, the great lecturer uses it to pay the mortgage, you know, or the grocery bill, or the car payment, and so. The exchange here of, a, of an intellectual spiritual value, right, wisdom, uh, in, in exchange ultimately for material values of the, of the, of the home, the car, uh, the food. So because of, uh, because of mind-body integration, values exist in uh, numerous forms. There's spiritual values such as you know, the dissemination of wisdom in a, in a in a really good teacher's class or a great lecturer's uh, presentation. There's intellectual spiritual values, there's material values like food and, and, uh, and so forth. And then notice there's composite values. They're a composite of both intellectual, spiritual, and material values. Now here, if you, this, this is a copy of my 2017 novel, A Dearth of Eagles. This is sold, so, but, uh, a novel or any book ultimately is the vision of the author. There's the ideas that the author has. And the theme, the theme, you can get this book easily from Amazon. Uh, the theme in A Dearth of Eagles is literary heroism versus literary anti-heroism. Uh, so there's, you know, there's a serious philosophic theme dramatized by the action, the, the main characters, uh, uh, freedom fighters behind the Iron Curtain in 1989, smuggling people across the mountains in, in, into the free world. Uh, but the, 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 there's a, a number of ideas expressed here. But this is not just a collection of ideas, right? These are ideas embodied in physical form. This is, this is in, in the material object of a book. This is a composite value. Of all, the, of, of, of all the ideas embodied in a material form. I take much greater books, whether, this is a good book, by the way, but uh, take, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, take much greater books, not just Ayn Rand's novels, you know, The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, for example, but, I mean, Darwin's Origin of Species, Newton's Principia, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, you could go on and on and naming, you know, naming var you know, various books that are brilliant uh, composite values, where there's you know, brilliant ideas expressed here in a, in, a, in a material form. So notice then, and similarly in music, you know, a, 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 great, mu a great musician, whether it's Drake or, uh, you guys know who Drake is? <laughs> Can't ask the kids, I'll tell you. You gotta get some culture. You don't know, you don't know. Betsy, you are so, Betsy, you are so white. I mean, it's just, not, not that there's anything wrong with that, right? But uh, Drake is a rapper and a big uh, Toronto Raptors fan, right? But, um, you know, whether it's Drake or whether it's the Rolling Stones or whether it's Beethoven or, you know, who, who, whatever, whatever genre of music, uh, you, you have the, the, the composer's vision, you know, the, 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 the musical... Uh, the, the, the musical material here, uh, which, is, which comes out of the, the musician, the composer's soul, and is ultimately a spiritual, uh, va intellectual value, but you have it in a CD. You, know, you have it in, in a material object. It's a, it's, it's, it's a composite value. And just think of how cool that is. You put the CD in your, in your CD player in your car, and you drive down the highway, and you listen, and you, and you listen to... To, to great music. I mean, I don't think our forebears crossing the continent in covered wagons had that advantage. But I mean, you, you, this is uh, this is one of the advantages of many of living in a of living in a modern capitalist society. So, notice again the cross poll the cross pollination of values. I could sell this book, and I did. I bought five copies with me and sold them uh, last night. Uh, I could sell this book, which is a composite value the cash. And then what, what do I do with the cash? Well, I could, I could uh, go up on Amazon and buy books, composite value for composite value. I can go to some concert. Uh, I can pay the, the entrance fee for, contra, uh, for a concert or at the Met or, uh, or for some great lecturer's uh, uh, presentation. There's a composite value for an intellectual value. Or more mundanely, I could uh, simply spend the money on food, you know, or on, uh, 
or on the, the rent. So there's the composite value uh, in exchange for ultimately for material values. So you see the cross-pollination uh, of value exchange that, that, the trade, that the trade of principle em, em, embodies in action. And it's really, that's really an example of the, the principle of mind-body in, in integration. So wisdom embodied in material form in a book in, ex, in exchange for, for food, but whatever it is. But justice, the, the principle, is that justice always involves human beings voluntarily exchanging values in some form and, and always important to keep in mind the currency ex uh, currencies exchanged must be of value to the recipient in every case. All right. So there's really only one more, one more point I wanted to make regarding the, 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 the trader principle, and that is notice how capitalism uh, is, is that capitalism is the system of, for, and by traders. Capitalism represents the political, economic, uh, institutionalizing of the trader principle. By, because what capitalism, the essence of capitalism, of course, is the principle of individual rights. You know, you, you respect and protect the right of each individual to live his, her life in accordance with his own, his own judgment, and of course, as a consequence of that, we ban the initiation of force. And so there's no, uh, under, under capitalism then, there's no attainment of wealth by plunder. It's done, uh, values are gained by production and by voluntary trade. And I think it's important to, to recognize that you, we already seen that the trader principle, of course, uh, enhances human life. It's it's uh, it makes possible in many ways human life. It consequently is is morally good by virtue of that alone. Capitalism, one of its many virtues, is that it institutionalizes the trader principle. It protects the right of every individual to trade freely as he or she will. In every arena of life from lectures to love, from business to books, from cuisine to construction, from A to Z, from architecture to zoology and everything in between, in every arena of human life, material and intellectual, uh, material and intellectual, spiritual, capitalism protects our right to trade freely. And so, I think it's important to refute one of the many contemporary objections uh, to capitalism. I'm sure, I'm sure you, you've heard this, that capitalism is too materialistic, that it generates this consumer, you know, this consumerist culture and, and, and everything. Uh, and so, you know, my daughter is a, is a big time shopper. You know, what a shock, 16 year old girl, she likes, she likes to shop, right? And so, you know, we spent, a, she and I spent a lot of time at the malls. And I've come, we're a couple of mall rats, as a matter of fact. And, and, I, and I've come to appreciate malls uh, in the last few years much more, much more than, I, than I ever have. They are, an American mall is a cornucopia of unlimited material wealth. It's just jaw-dropping. I mean, some of these malls, they're four or five stories and they go on seemingly for miles and it's just wall to wall stuff. It's wall to wall material wealth. And so one answer to the, to the, um, uh, you know, to the criticism that capitalism is materialistic or, you know, generates this consumerist culture is, you say that as though it were a bad thing, <laughs> you know. Uh, the people who come out of starving third world countries, the wealth, uh, in, in the material wealth of the United States is something that they long for and are willing to, you know, in many cases, risk their lives to gain. And so many of them want, want it that there are certain people in the country, won't uh, mention any names, who want to build walls, you know, to keep, uh, <laughs> to keep the, uh, uh, people out. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, I mean, any, everything we need to know about the capitalism versus socialism dispute is, is, is embodied right there. 
The communists build walls to keep people in. The capitalists want to build walls to keep people out. I mean, that's, that, really, that really tells us everything you know, we, we, we need to know. But the, the, the point here is, of course, the, the, the material wealth uh, present here, uh, uh, seen you know, in, in, a, in, a, in an American mall, is good. It's good. It's, it's unqualifiedly good because material wealth is necessary to sustain human bodily life. So that's one answer. But, um, and, and by the way, just as an aside, I'm, uh, as somebody who's a dilettante in economics and knows just a little bit about the field, it is just endlessly astonishing how many clothing stores proliferate in, in the malls, specializing in, in women's clothing. You know, so they, they, they'll often, you know, whether it's American Eagle or Aeropostale or Forever 21 or whatever it is, very often they'll sell men's clothing too, but they specialize in, in women's clothing. And what a shock, you know, women, women like clothes, women like shoes. There's a newsflash for you. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, it's good. It promotes bodily life. But the second point, of course, is uh, the second answer to, to, the, to the objection that capitalism is materialistic is look at the flourishing of every type of intellectual, spiritual value made possible by the principle of individual rights. The, the novels written, the symphonies composed, the rock music, the rap, uh, wh whatever it is, theories in science and, and, and in uh, architecture and in, in, any, in, in, in medicine, every book imaginable published, sold by Amazon on, in every subject, every field, every point of view, as long as you don't try and defend capitalism on Facebook. But every, every I remember in 2009, when my book Objectivism in One Lesson was published by a division of Roman Littlefield, you know, we, we conceived it as the definitive intro text to objectivism, the link between Ayn Rand's novels and Opal. Uh, and I lectured on it at Barnes & Noble on, on 6th Avenue, uh, you know, down by NYU. Unfortunately, Barnes & Noble is, is out of business, that, that Barnes & Noble is out of business. You know, but I just pointed on the start the thousands of books on every conceivable topic, and, and today even more because Amazon prides itself on selling every book published. So even if you don't want to publish with one of the dinosaurs or, or they don't, they're not interested in what you have to say, the self-publishing option, uh, the technology for the self-publishing option, of course, today is brilliant. Harry Binswang, who published his book on self-published his book on epistemology and who urged me to self-publish my hero book, I, I didn't want to do it. Uh, but if anybody wants to self-publish, Amazon prides itself on selling every book that's published. And there's like thousands of them on every conceivable topic. <laughs> All of this made possible by the system of individual rights. I mean, what do you think would have happened to Ayn Rand if she tried to publish We the Living you know, in the Soviet Union? Well, they would have sent her to a gulag and where her life expectancy would have been measured in a, in a, in a matter of months. So the, the principle of individual rights makes possible the flourishing of every type of intellectual and spiritual value. And we need to recognize that even in the universities where I'm not, you know, I'm not a big fan of their humanities programs, but there's thousands of colleges and universities in the United States. Almost every one of them has a philosophy department Almost every one of them, probably every one of them has a literature program, history, every, every, every type of, of theory, uh, of course in the sciences, any type of theory can, can be presented uh, and so on. So uh, the, maybe the most, certainly the most overlooked value of capitalism is the immense creation of intellectual, spiritual values that, that it makes possible. I think, I think capitalism's supporters recognize, you know, uh, uh, and, and the economists have certainly uh, validated, you know, the immense creation of material wealth. And Ayn Rand has, has explained human life is the standard of value and the, you know, and so that, you know, we are, as Americans, we are proudly the fattest people in history. You know, and the, that's a joke, we're supposed to laugh. But um, <laughs> the, uh, 
the immense creation of material wealth is a good thing. I think it's often overlooked the, tre the tremendous, the, the profound importance of uh, creating and trading intellectual, spiritual values that that's, that that's made is made possible by the system of individual rights. And that's, that's, that's uh, uh, enormously life uh, advancing. That's too often overlooked even by capitalism's defenders. Now, so let me wrap this up. Therefore, to, pro to protect our right to free trade in every arena of human life, across the board, intellectual, spiritual, as well as material, we must use our minds, our voices, and our vote to defend capitalism, the system of foreign by traders. Thank you. All right, so we have. 15 minutes or so for, for questions. Yes, this young lady. Hey, thank you. Um, there are some people in my life to whom I feel they're paid for life. Um, but I struggle sometimes seeing the value that I'm providing to them. So sometimes they're much, they're my intellectual seniors and they have a lot more life experience, so I'm not gonna pay them back in some life-changing insight. And they won't let me pay for anything because they say I'm at the beginning of my career and they wanna support me. So. As a mentee, I often struggle to see what is it the value that I'm providing to these people who, for me, I, I often describe as heroes. They're untouchable to me. As a mentor, can you maybe share your experience and help me see it? Yeah, absolutely. Did everybody hear the question? I mean, I mean, Leonard Peikoff trained me to repeat questions. Uh, but, but she's saying there, there are mentors who, who've given up tremendous you know, wisdom, advice, guidance, and, 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 and she doesn't see any way that she can repay that. Well, first of all, what, one point, like I said in the talk, is a, a, a heartfelt thank you uh, to, to these benefactors go, goes a long way. But, uh, but always remember something. I mean, I've mentored a, a number of people in, uh, in my life. And, and, and let me go back a little bit, because um, you, you guys know the phrase, pass it forward? You know, Ayn Rand, of course, taught Leonard Peikoff and Harry Binswanger, she mentored them. Leonard and Harry mentored me. Uh, they passed it forward. I do that with, with my students. I pass it forward as, 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 as much as I can, and I urge them you know, to, to, do, to do the same. It is enormous value, let me tell you, because I've been on both ends of this. It is an enormous value to the mentor to see his students or children or offspring, intellectual offspring flourish. It's an enormous value. I used to have students who come back. They don't pay me much to teach in terms of money, but I get paid in other ways. And you know, I, a lot of times my students come back Students will come back five years after graduation. Oh, Dr. Bernstein, you, know, um, you remember me? I said, oh, no, actually, I don't. But <laughs> it was five years ago. But I learned so much in your logic class. You know, I wanted to thank you, you know, for, every, for everything you know, that I would, I would be able to apply in, you know, in my career. It is an enormous value to a teacher or a mentor to see uh, his or her students flourish. Because why? Because human life is important. And, to, and, and, and you, you flourish, you you flap your wings and fly, and the people who've been mentoring you, that's what they want. And you're gonna give it to them. And they're gonna be enormously joyous to see you flourish. Hello. So um, I really resonate strongly with the harmony of your rational values. But as we go through this conversation, the one thing always comes back to me. So my question is, is how can one best articulate the benefits of the trader principle when societies and individuals are overwhelmed with greed? You know, not just the value of money, but the value of being too greedy to let someone pass the street safely, you know? Um, and so theoretically, even so, they realize and they accept that there's a benefit, but it's almost like they're too gritty, uh, greedy and it's not worth applying themselves. So how can you articulate that further to enhance their understanding of the benefit? I don't mean to uh, bust your chops, as they say, but <laughs> I always teach my logic students, make, be sure you're very clear on what the question's asking. Because if you're clear on the question, it'll point you directly to that aspect of reality that answers it. Now, now what, could you phrase the, I didn't follow the question. What, what's the question, like, in, succinctly and exactly? Okay, so how can we articulate to people who don't believe in the trader principle 
the benefits of it when they theoretically realize it, but they're not willing to give anything up themselves. They're not willing to exchange value for value? Like they're too, they're too greedy. So they know they should do more trading and more changes and exchanges and this and that, and we want to promote that. Um, but like being, being human, right? Like letting someone cross the road and saying like that this kind of lifestyle is beneficial for everyone. Oh, okay. So, so they're just, they're just going to barrel through the intersection of somebody stuck there. You'll bleep you, do you, you know, then, right? It's too, too bad for you. Well, does the person own a, does, does the person hold a job? I mean, do they, do they want, do they, do they want to get paid in exchange for the work they do? I mean, I mean, that's, that's a value. Do they have friends? <laughs> You're not going to have friends for too very long if all they do is, 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 use, the, is use the other person and, and, and reciprocate in, in, in no way. Do they have a romantic relationship? That's going to last even a shorter period of time, you know, if there's no, if there's no re reciprocity. So the, uh, I think it's, it should be fairly clear just at a very common sense level. You could do this at a, at a very common sense level that... Uh, in, 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 in any number of those, in any number of those examples, you, you know, another example, you, you pay money in tuition to go to school, and you want to get some benefit from it. There's, there's a trade, and you expect to pay the money in return for the wisdom, you know, uh, achieved in, in, in your educational process. So, just at any number of, I, I would start out with any number of examples at a common sense level to show the, the, the benefits of trading value for value. And then, and then move on to the, you know, to the more sophisticated ones. Or well, maybe the, 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 the simpler ones, like I, like I mentioned before. Sometimes the people that you're talking about, I think, are, are materialists. That is, they think all there is in human life is material stuff. And they're, and they're not seeing the enormous, profound, selfish advantage of having human relationships, of having friends, of having love, you know, of just of just letting the guy go and wave back and forth and there's this moment of human contact and there's, uh, you know, it enhances uh, both of your lives. There's, 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 I think some people are just are materialistic. All they, all they see are, are the material values. Not that there's anything wrong with that, right? We need material values in order to survive. Never mind flourish. But there's more to life than that. Money is a great thing. I, you know, here's, here's what a problem I've noticed regarding egoism, you know, the moral code that endorses us to, to pursue our self-interest. Uh, regarding egoism, I think very often the supporters of egoism, as well as its critics, construe it too narrowly. They construe self-interest as strictly in financial terms. You know, so you make a lot of money. And you know, that, that they, they, they recognize that, and often that alone is self-interest. Now, if you work hard and honestly and make a lot of money, that is certainly in your self-interest. That's a great value. It's all good. Uh, it's all good all the time, but it's hardly the only value of human life, right? Friendship, love, you know, human intimacy, education, bodily health, mental health. I mean, all these things are enormous values that people often pay a lot of money to, to get. For instance, I haven't always been this paragon of mental health you see before you right now. <laughs> I, paid, I paid a lot of money over a lot of years in psychotherapy. You know, coming out of a crazy family, living in a crazy world to, to, over, to overcome that. Mental health, what's the price on mental health? Rather than being a, a, you know, a freaking neurotic. Uh, so there, there's, there's enormous value in other things besides material goods. You might want to, after you start off with the common sense examples, you might want to show people, you know, trading value for value here. I always joke, I put the shrinks kids through college, you know? <laughs> but uh, I got a lot of value. You know, if I gave him money, he gave me increased mental health. Who got the, who got the greater value here? I did, right? So uh, yeah, I mean, there's any, once, once you start with the common sense values, I think then you, could, you, then you could radiate out to the more sophisticated values. And just, listen, dude, you know, if, if you don't see the great benefits you could get from, you know, Trading value for value with close friends and a romantic, you know, a lover and everything. Uh, see better. You know, try it. Try it and see. That's what I would tell them. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for you, no problem. <laughs> hey, look who it is. The great John Hersey. What's a CD? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have a real question. Um, so often in these trades, there is a chance taken on one side. Um, you mentioned Atlas. 
Uh, Midas Mulligan was great at spotting value and investing in it. Um, do you have any thoughts on um, taking the first step, taking a chance and in investing in people? And um, maybe if you want to expand on that too, uh, when you think it's good to back off in a, in a relationship like that? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question because it's a you know it's a it's a judgment call, and um, I remember without without naming any names, I you know remember a, a very good friend of mine you know when we were teenagers we were basketball buddies and, and and we were really close I mean we were more than friends you know we were we were we were brothers, and um, uh, to put it simply he became a, a big time drug abuser, and um, and I knew he was going to kill himself. And, uh, uh, you know, eventually by overdose, he was my brother, and I, and, I, and I loved him. And I went a long way to try and save his life. I mean, he, he was a special person to me. It was a long way, but a lot of effort uh, into that. And he got more and more cynical, more and more of a, you know, of a, of a drug addict and spit in my face, uh, figuratively speaking. And eventually I had to just let it go. You make a judgment call as, you know, is, 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 can I still relate to this person? Can this person be, can they, are, are they willing to, you know, change their life? Can, you know, can, can, can they be helped? And at some point, if the honest answer, heartbreaking as it is, is no, then I, you know, have to, have to let, have to let it go. I, you know, I, it's impossible. And I tell my students this all the time. Uh, you know, it's, it's impossible for me to love my friend more than he loves himself. That puts me in an impossible position. And, it, and there's a, a certain parallel with my students. And I tell them, it's, and I care about your education very much, but it's impossible for me to care more about your education than you do. And if, you, if you're not willing to put the effort in to get the education, then, you know, uh, it's, it puts me in a hopeless situation trying to teach you. And I just focus on the kids in class who want you know, who value their education as much as I value it for them. So it's always a judgment call, and when you care about somebody, it's tough to, to, to let them go. But some, you know, sometimes what they call tough love, you know, is, you know, is what's necessary. And I tell my drug-addicted friend, look, you're going to die. You're going to kill yourself. What is, what, you know, you're going to kill yourself in, in your 20s, and uh, I, I see there's nothing I could do to help you, and I'm done. And he did kill himself. Yeah. On that happy note. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, want, I want to start off by thanking you, Dr. Bernstein, because when I first read Atlas Rugged back in 94, I was kind of directionless in life, and your talk on how to spread objectivism really kind of clarified and gave me a direction, sense of direction when I went into the military and continued to you know, get used copies and when I checked people into the command to give them. Let me, let me stop you right here, but I'll, I'll let you ask you a question. Sure. Uh, you reminded me of something. Uh, I, I only met Ayn Rand uh, uh, briefly on a few occasions, but one of them was in Leonard Peikoff's apartment in, in, in New York City in the Q&A, uh, uh, his, his grammar course, she, you know, she was, she was there. Because generally after uh, one of Leonard's classes, everybody would go up and, 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 and surround him with questions. The night Ayn Rand was there, everybody ignored Leonard, they went to, they went to Ayn Rand. <laughs> Which makes sense, how often do you have a chance to talk to an epoch-making genius? And, uh, one of my friends, I won't mention any, any names here, in a lull in the conversation, I knew he came out of this crazy family, and he said to her, he said to Ayn Rand, in a heartfelt way, he said, Miss Rand, thank you. And Ayn Rand looked at him, you look into those genius eyes, you know, and I think she realized he was thanking her for saving his life. And she said to him, you're welcome. So it's a set, it's a set to shiver <laughs> down my spine. It is the single most benevolent scene I've ever witnessed in my entire life. So you thank me for introducing you to you know, Ayn Rand. My response to you is, you're welcome. Thank you. And, and, and that's exactly, I feel like you know, I came out of a similar background of being fragmented and needing something to provide the catalyst to integrate and to, and to define and to then achieve values. You know, um, but my question, I guess, would be that connection. I loved your talk focusing on the trader principle because I've come to, since after specializing in linguistics, to regard that as sort of the nucleus of the philosophy with the benevolent universe conviction as its corollary and then maybe, maybe centered on, on a sense of justice, a sense of respect that we give to one another and then the, 
statement of Rourke in the Fountainhead, we live in our minds and existence is the attempt to bring that life into physical reality to say it in gesture and form, speaks to the issue of mentorship, I think, also. That we, that we see that the, some, sometimes the best payment we can get is, is what everybody's competing for on social media platforms, a sense of visibility, a sense of recognition, a sense that this thought doesn't end with you, that you, that, that, that you are part of making a better world, at least in principle. So, are you going to give a speech, or are you going to ask a question? I, 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 I just just to see uh, that as the corollary, the benevolent universe, and the way in which it is a corollary, and the way that in which the traitor principle is maybe you would qualify that as either being like the nucleus of the entire philosophical system. Uh, uh, the entire philosophical metaphysics system of objectivism? and epistemology giving rise to the traitor principle. You know, that, I, I think I, I think I get it, um, yeah. and uh, I've always thought. <laughs> I see we're running out of time, so let me make this, this quick. I always thought that values are the centerpiece of the objectivist philosophy, that they're the hub. You know, that, uh, you know, to put it this way, reason is the indispensable means. We, rationality is mankind's means of survival. But fulfilled living, eudaimonia, you know, as Aristotle put it, flourishing life with its emotional concomitant of happiness, that's the end. Right? And we gain happiness by holding rational, life-promoting values and, and fulfilling them. So I think all roads, in, and then why do we need capitalism when you get to politics? Like I said, because it's the system that protects individuals' rights to produce and trade values. So you know, I think all roads in objectivism lead into values or lead, you know, out, you know, lead out of values. It's the hub or the centerpiece of the philosophy. So if that's the point you're making, you're right. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to sound like a wise guy to you when I told you. Well, you were asking. No, I, I, I really uh, do. And I, and I was just going to say that I see the nucleus as the, the virtue and then the values is coming from that sense of the singular, singular uh, okay. sense of virtue. Right. Go ahead. We only have a couple minutes. So, 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 go, so sure, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein, for the talk and for being yourself. We love you. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> No, thank you. So um, my question is, uh, I mean, I, I live in a rural area, right? So uh, my social network over there is pretty limited. And some of my best friends uh, live not near my area. So uh, even though, you know, there's a value for value trade in our relationship and we love each other and all this stuff, um, I find myself or I find the relationship not constantly engaged. Like we're, we're disconnected until we meet face to face again. Um, and my question is, how can I continue to foster relationships that are physically separated? You know, that's a good question, and it, and it leads me uh, to a related point, because you hear these anti-technology types all the time, you know, saying stuff like, ah, everybody's on their phone all the time, and they don't talk to people, and they don't have, you know, human contact. And um, you point out, that's a, that's a matter of personal choice. If we want... The, the immense value of intimate human contact, that's our choice. We don't have to, you know, we don't have to be sending, you know, reading stuff online on, on our phone. We could be talking to human beings. The point, of course, is for people who value human intimacy, the technology enormously enhances that. So, I, I mean, your own examples, your, your friends are far flung. Prior to the technology, Skype, you know, or, or FaceTime or, or, or whatever, whatever it is, uh, WhatsApp, it would be very, you, you, back in the day, we would have been sending letters by snail mail or maybe talking on the phone. Long yeah, yeah. distance was expensive. I, I mean, I troll my extended family on uh, our WhatsApp. Yeah, group. it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. yeah. You, I, I mean, I, a friend of mine whose family's in Bulgaria and he Skypes with them, you know, uh, at, 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 at least once a week. When I was in Bulgaria teaching at American University three years ago, I was FaceTime with my daughter, you know, on a, on a regular basis. So, so I would say, Definitely continue to use the technology to, to enhance the relationship with, with, your, with your friends and then do whatever it, whatever it takes to physically get together because I mean, that, with, that's even better. With mentioning whatever it takes, I mean, there's a certain point in which you can put yourself out there a certain amount, but they need to reciprocate. They need to oh, yeah. you know, initiate contact. Otherwise, even if the relationship is excellent and, you know, when in person, in physical person, you're just the best of friends, but yeah, well, that's that's absolutely true. The uh, any any human relationship, 
whether friends or, or lovers, requires reciprocity, the trading value for value. I, you, and you can make very clear to your, 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 your friends, your, your girlfriend, whoever it is, you know, I, re I love you, I really value you. And if, if, they, don't, if they don't reciprocate, then, and they continue not to reciprocate, continually don't reciprocate, even after you plead with them to reciprocate, well, then you have to ask yourself, do we really have the kind of relationship that I want? And you need to find the, you need to find the, the people who, who value you the way you value them. And the technology is good for that. Sure. I mean, Facebook allows us to meet people all over the world and, you know, Skype and, you know, and everything enables us to uh, stay in touch with people all over the world. And, um, and, then, and then you could, that way you can find the people all over the world who value you the way you value them. And they both get a job. And, and, and there's, this, there's this new device. They're called jet planes. You could get on one, you know, and you could fly can across the one? pond. <laughs> You could fly across the pond, you know, to, to see your buddies or your or your girlfriend, and 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 he or she could come here to see you. Yeah. So I get we're out of time, Conrad. All right, thank you. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs> so should I should I continue with the Tony Montana look? Oh. <laughs>